we're currently looking at virulence factors that bacteria produce that damage the host. So of course we talked about the excessive inflammatory cytokine production that can occur uh, during SIRS as a result of PAMPs binding to PRRs. And we're currently talking about the ability to produce harmful exotoxins. And as we mentioned, there are three categories of exotoxins called type one, type two, and type three. So in unit three, lecture four, part two, this soft chalk lesson deals with type 1 toxins, also known as super antigens. Now to understand how super antigens work, we have to understand how antigens are normally processed uh, by our T4 lymphocytes. And we'll be getting into this in detail in Unit 6. But uh, we're going to give you a little preview of that so we can understand the mechanism of action for these super antigens. So super antigens are unusual bacterial toxins in that they interact with exceedingly large numbers of T4 lymphocytes. Now lymphocytes are one of our five types of white blood cells and T4 lymphocytes are ones that specifically regulate the immune responses through the cytokines they produce. And the super antigens, unlike other antigens we'll be talking about that can enter cells, bind to the surface of the cell, but they don't enter the cell. What they do is activate, uh, as we said, exceedingly large numbers of T4 lymphocytes. Now, again, to understand the significance of activating large numbers of T4 lymphocytes, we have to understand what conventional antigens do. Now, in order to normally activate our T4 lymphocytes, again, the white blood cells we need to regulate immunity through cytokine production. Conventional antigens have to be engulfed by special cells called antigen presenting cells or APCs, such as dendritic cells and macrophages that we'll learn about later on in unit five when we get to the cells involved in body defenses. So these antigens from microorganisms are engulfed by antigen presenting cells because they are phagocytes. They're degraded into epitopes, which then bind to grooves uh, in molecules called MHC2 molecules, molecules only made by antigen presenting cells. And then these epitopes are displayed on the surface of the antigen presenting cell by way of these MHC2 molecules. And in this way, they can be recognized by specific T4 lymphocytes that have a T cell receptor that fits that epitope on that MHC2 molecule. Now, again, that's a lot to kind of process here, but let's look at a couple of illustrations to give you the general idea how that works. And again, we'll get into this in more detail in Unit 6 when we get into adaptive immunity. So if we look at our figure one, Let's say that the antigen in this case is a virus. So uh, this antigen presenting cell here is what we call a dendritic cell. And their job is to process antigens and present them to uh, T4 and T8 lymphocytes to activate those cells. So it starts out with a microorganism being engulfed and put in a phagosome as we see in step one here. Lysosome fuses with the phagosome and acid hydrolases degrade the proteins into peptides, short chains of amino acids. Now, meanwhile, antigen presenting cells are able to make a special molecule in their endoplasmic reticulum called MHC2 molecules. And so what happens is that these get packaged by the Golgi, the MHC2 molecules. They fuse with the uh, phagolysosome that contains the peptides and these peptides, all these different peptides from that virus or that bacterium or whatever the antigen was that was engulfed are attached to these MHC2 molecules which are then transported to the surface of that antigen presenting cell. So what these antigen presenting cells do is they take protein antigens, degrade them into peptides attach them to MHC2 molecules and display all those different peptides all over the surface of that antigen presenting cell. And that's where they get the name antigen presenting cell. 
they're going to present antigens, all these different epitopes, to T4 lymphocytes. And figure two shows how a T4 lymphocyte then interacts with the antigen presenting cell. So every T4 lymphocyte becomes programmed to make a unique receptor called the T cell receptor that has a shape that will fit some epitope on an MHC2 molecule. And that T cell receptor along with the CD4 molecule that gives the T4 lymphocyte its name is able to recognize then peptides that fit its T cell receptor on MHC2 molecules. And that antigen presenting cell now activates that T4 lymphocyte. So antigen presenting cells are the ones that activate naive T4 and T8 lymphocytes as we'll see later on. But again, this is a very specific reaction. If we go back up to our illustration figure one, there might be a T4 lymphocyte that recognizes that peptide on that MHC2 molecule. There'd be a different T4 lymphocyte that recognizes that epitope on that MHC2 molecule. There'd be another T4 cell to recognize that epitope. So these T cell receptors are very specific for a specific peptide epitope displayed on an MHC2 molecule by an antigen presenting cell. So normally, only a few T4 lymphocytes would be activated in response to a specific antigen in a conventional antigen reaction. But super antigens do something a little different. They bind directly to the outside of the MHC2 molecule and they're then able to activate very large numbers of T4 lymphocytes. So if we take a look at figure three, notice that we have a naive T4 lymphocyte on the left here, and its T cell receptor, notice right here in pink, doesn't fit that peptide of that MHC21. So normally, this T4 cell on the right would not be activated because its T cell receptor doesn't fit that epitope. But what the super antigen does is it locks on pretty much any antigen presenting cell to any T4 cell that is in the vicinity and activates it. So because the T cell receptors no longer have to match, the super antigens can cause antigen presenting cells to activate large numbers of unrelated T4 lymphocytes. For example, the normal immune response to a conventional antigen, uh, maybe one in every 10,000 T lymphocytes would be activated by that antigen. And they would be activated in response to different epitopes of that antigen. But a super antigen can activate as many as one in five T lymphocytes. So excessive numbers of T4 lymphocytes become activated by super antigens. Also super antigens seem to activate self-reactive T lymphocytes, T lymphocytes that would normally be destroyed and not react with anything because they have receptors that fit our own epitopes. Uh, but these can activate the self-reactive T4 lymphocytes and can lead to autoimmune damage as well. So when these super antigens activate large numbers of T4 lymphocytes. The activation of large numbers of T4 lymphocytes causes secretion of very high levels of a cytokine called interleukin-2. And that in turn can lead to various symptoms. Uh, when high levels of interleukin-2 enter the circulation, they can lead to symptoms like fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and malaise. But excessive stimulation of interleukin-2 also leads to production of the same inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, inflammatory chemokines like interleukin-1, platelet-activating factor. These are the same cytokines we saw that occurred, inflammatory cytokines when PAMPs activate PRRs, causing excessive cytokine production. So the super antigens, by producing too much interleukin-2, leading to the production of excessive amounts of inflammatory cytokines, cause the same damage, SIRS-type reactions, that PAMPs can cause. <clears throat> 
They can damage the endothelial cells, leading to bleeding. They can lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome, disseminated intravascular coagulation, circulatory collapse or shock, multiple organ system failure, similar to the PAMPs we talked about previously. And of course, by activating large numbers of T4 lymphocytes, uh, there's also sometimes activation of self-reactive T4 lymphocytes can, that can further lead to autoimmune attack. Fortunately, there aren't a whole lot of these super antigens because they are pretty nasty. Uh, one of the most common ones is toxic shock syndrome toxin 1 or TSST1 produced by certain strains of Staphylococcus aureus. Now remember, most strains of Staphylococcus aureus cause wound abscesses, accidental or post-operative wound infections. But some strains can produce toxic shock syndrome toxin 1, and these can lead to potentially fatal toxic shock syndrome. Again, by activating large numbers of T4 lymphocytes, you get excessive cytokine production, leading to fever, rash, and circulatory collapse or shock. Streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxin, or SPE, is another super antigen. And this is produced by what are called rare invasive strains or scarlet fever strains of Streptococcus pyogenes, the group A beta strep that normally cause Streptococcal pharyngitis. But some strains of Streptococcus pyogenes can produce these SPEs or Streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxins, which are type 1 uh, toxins. And there's a number of these uh, SPEs that Streptococcus pyogenes can produce. They can kill cells, that is, they're cytotoxic. They can induce fever, that is, they're pyrogenic. They can enhance the lethal effects of endotoxins, and they can contribute to cytokine-induced inflammatory damage, just like uh, the TSST1 that Staph aureus produces can cause. So SPEs are responsible for streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, STSS, streptococcal toxic shock syndrome, to differentiate from staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome. But again, excessive cytokine production leads to the same toxic shock type of syndrome where you get fever, rash, triggering the shock cascade. Uh, the SPEs from Streptococcus pyogenes also appear to be responsible for another disorder caused by these invasive strains of strep called necrotizing fasciitis. And th this toxin can destroy the skin, fat, and tissue covering the muscle, what's called the fascia. And then one of these streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxins, SPEB, is a precursor to a cysteine protease that can actually break down the um, proteins in muscle tissue. And so the streptococci that produce these SPEs leading to necrotizing fasciitis and the cysteine proteases to destroy muscle tissue are what have commonly gotten to be referred to as the flesh-eating strep. But the disease is actually called necrotizing fasciitis and that's due to another type 1 toxin. Staphylococcal enterotoxins, SE, are produced mainly by Staphylococcus aureus strains, and these are responsible for Staphylococcal food poisoning. In this case, the Staphylococci are introduced into food that requires a lot of handling, usually by a healthy nasal carrier that's carrying the Staphylococci or someone who has abscesses on the hands. Uh, typically, the food's not refrigerated properly. It's not cooked, and that allows the staphylococci to grow in the food and uh, secrete these enterotoxins, which are then ingested. And when ingested, you get an excess of interleukin-2 production by activating of large numbers of T4 lymphocytes, leading to common symptoms of staphylococcal food poisoning like nausea, fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. The toxins may also stimulate the vagus nerve to help stimulate more vomiting, which is actually a body defense to remove the toxins. And another final example is bacteria called ETEC for enterotoxigenic E. coli. Unlike most E. coli that live in the intestinal tracts as microbiota, enterotoxigenic E. coli are what we call diarrheogenic E. coli. 
E. coli that can cause diarrhea, in this case because they produce a type 1 toxin called enterotoxin. And enterotoxins are toxins that cause loss of fluid and electrolytes and diarrhea. And so the enterotoxic, enterotoxigenic E. coli are one of the more common causes of traveler's diarrhea. So those are four examples of type 1 toxins or super antigens. Uh, some when ingested leading to diarrhea type infections with maybe vomiting and diarrhea. And then the others potentially more severe can lead to things like toxic shock syndrome or necrotizing fasciitis. So those are the type 1 toxins and there's a little self check you can do as always at the end. In the next soft chalk lesson, we'll be looking at type 2 toxins.